The Holy Gospel this evening comes from St. Luke in the 10th chapter. Now, after this, uh, Jesus uh, appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on the way. See, I'm sending you out like lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. And whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. And whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. The gospel of the Lord. We have in this little vignette from Jesus sending out the disciples two by two not only a, a bit of a mandate, but a, a bit of a way of understanding what we're being asked to do as, as disciples of Jesus Christ. We are asked to, to participate in the story that God has, that the story that God tells for all of creation, all of the cosmos itself. It is a story of peace. It is a story of peace that transcends our own individual communities, homes, neighborhoods, towns, villages, states, countries, whatever it might be, planets themselves, as God yearns to have all of creation live in peace. But as much as that major story that sort of carries us all out uh, in everything that we're asked to do for God's peace, it only happens as we, in our own lives, live out that peace, person to person, friend to friend, neighbor to neighbor, enemy to enemy. Only as peace is that space between you and your neighbor, you and your enemy, that that space that exists where peace can reside, can the peace of God that's intended for all of creation be lived out, be experienced. And the hope and the goal, of course, is that one uh, is able, over the course of time, to be able to tell your story so that the peace of God sort of emanates from you. You know, in the story that John Mark read for us in the book of Acts, I mean, Paul's just preaching and preaching and preaching. A kid falls out of the window and dies. Paul goes down, re- uh, resurrects him, gets back up, and then keeps preaching. You know, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I might have taken a break right then. I mean, if my preaching seriously caused someone to fall asleep, fall out a window, and die, I might have said to myself, you know, maybe I need a nap, you know, but not Paul. He's got a story to tell, and he just keeps telling it until it's done. And it's that ability to be able to tell a story that, that's being asked of us when Jesus sends us out two by two, when he sent out those original disciples, and he sends out you and I. You know, Chris and I have a, been together now for some 30 32, 33 years. And it is still a living question whether I am a pawn in her battle with God or whether she is a pawn in my battle with God. Sometimes it looks like I'm just, I'm just there for, you know, to be the first person to die. You know, like in Star Trek when the people always wore the red shirts and you knew they were going to die by the first commercial break. I, I sometimes feel like that because God and Chris seem to be in this, this cosmic battle and I'm just ready to be the first guy shot with a taser. You know? But then at other times, of course, from her perspective, it looks like God and I are in a battle and, and she's wearing the red shirt ready to be picked off at e- earliest convenience. So it, it's never easy to tell whose story you're in, whether you're in the story with the other person or they're in your story or, or whether the story you're kind of creating and telling. But, it, but what's important is that the story gets told. What's important is that the story gets told. So, for example, <coughs> my first call... Uh, I, I, had, uh, I was given five hours a week to go out into the neighborhood and, and knock on doors uh, and, and invite people to church. And we were in a bustling, huge community just outside of Chicago, this massive amounts of homes being built, hundreds a day, 
hundreds a day. And there was always a new neighborhood for me to go visit. And I picked Thursday afternoons uh, from uh, you know, noon to five or so was my five-hour window. Uh, and I just drive to a neighborhood and, and I could go to a place and there would be no houses there. Uh, and I'd visit and then the next two weeks later, there'd be 10 houses there. And I'd knock on the doors and of course, nobody's ever home. Because one of the things about uh, suburban America in the 90s was that uh, everybody had these homes, but because they were all busy working, there was nobody actually at home. And uh, so whenever I would call, uh, very rarely would I ever have anybody there. And if it was, it was usually because they were sick or uh, if they were um, uh, Muslim or if they were Buddhist. We had seemed to have an influx of people moving from Chicago who were, who were Muslim or Buddhist. And uh, so I'd have many conversations uh, with uh, Muslim women, Buddhist women, uh, over my time there uh, about you know, life in general. They were, they were the only ones home, so, you know, they got, they got the full, you know, visit. I, you know, I was supposed to spend like five minutes with each person, but oftentimes with, when somebody was actually home, I could spend as much time as they let me because nobody else was going to be home. And uh, I remember having just fascinating conversations. So one day I'm sitting in my office, and I, it's, it's, it's in the afternoon. It's getting kind of dark. It's about four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, nice summer day. And um, all of a sudden, one of, the, one of the neighbor women came in with, with her son. He was, he was three years old. And she said, uh, do, you, uh, do you do religious education? And I said, we sure do. We, do. we got Sunday school, Sunday morning. You know, we had Sunday school. We had two Sunday schools, actually. We had an early one and a late one. We had Sunday school, perfect. Three-year-old, that's perfect time to get started. And she goes, okay. She goes, and she said, now, it won't be a problem. We're Buddhist. I was like, well... No, it's not a problem for us, but you do realize that we're known as Light of Christ Lutheran Church, right? She goes, oh, yeah. And I was like, so we teach Christianity? She goes, oh, yeah. And I said, and your son is Buddhist? She goes, yes. And I said, so you're okay with that? And she said, sure. And I said, oh. She said, well, look at it this way, Pastor. If whatever God is is true, won't really matter what he does when he's three, will it? I was like, huh. All right. So I signed him up for Sunday school. Ah, it just so happens I happen to have a Sunday school teacher. <laughs> she comes up to me after the Sunday and she says, Do you know one of my kids is Buddhist? And I looked her right in the face and I said, Do you know your husband is Jewish? She goes, Oh, yeah. <laughs> we get so caught up sometimes in, 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 in telling, and in, in, in if we're going to tell the story right, or, or if we're going to get all the little dots, uh, I's dotted and T's crossed, that sometimes we get too scared to tell the story. That, that, you know, we know people have other stories, that there are other stories out there, the Buddhist story or the Jewish story or whatever it may be. And, 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 and because of politeness or because of our own insecurity or fear, we, 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 we hold in the story of Jesus Christ. We don't want to seem arrogant or rude. We don't want to seem boastful. We don't, we don't want to seem, you know, m maleficent or anything like that. We want to be able to, to be loving, caring creatures, and in the face of this kind of diversity of religious plurality that comes at us, we just kind of freeze up. Say, oh yeah, um, I heard of that, and I, I'm Christian, and we just kind of walk away, hoping they don't press the question any farther than that. And that's why this story from the Gospel of Luke that Jesus tells is so vital to our faith. Because it reminds us that we have a very simple message. The simple message is peace to you and your household. It's a hard, it's a hard one to screw up. <laughs> I mean, you've probably all got it memorized. I mean, close your eyes and say it with me. Peace to you and your household. I mean, you can probably do it from memory. Because what God is looking for is that God's people live together in harmony and love. And the story of Jesus Christ and his death and his resurrection is precisely the story of God seeing that love and that peace through the trials of suffering and death. Because what I discovered over the years is that if I ran into someone who was Buddhist or Islamic or Jewish or didn't believe in any God at all or anything like that, oftentimes they struggled with suffering and death. 
If there is a God of love, how can somebody die? If there is a God of peace, how can there be suffering? And we want to throw God out with the bathwater. But rather, what's being asked of us in the story of Jesus Christ is to see that precisely in the midst of suffering, in the tears of grief and death, the promise of God is just as real as when the babies are gurgling, when the celebrations are singing happy birthday, and the champagne corks are flying. And as God is alive at those moments of celebration, God is also there in those moments of tragedy and tear. And that the story of God's peace is not stopped by our ability to articulate it correctly or make sure that we get it right, but rather the story of God's peace is only stopped by silence, only stopped by shyness, rectitude, or whatever else gets in the way of letting somebody know that they are loved beyond their wildest imagination. That regardless of whether you're at a wonderful 4th of July barbecue celebrating a birth of a new great-grandchild or whether you're there with some kind of wonderful event happening or whether you're there grieving in Darren's mortuary over the death of a beloved sister, the promise of God is still true. We are all loved beyond our wildest imagination. And it is not incumbent upon us as the disciples to make sure that we get the story right. It is not incumbent upon us that we make sure that we only say the things that are appropriate, but rather we say the things that are loving, that are compassionate, that are peaceful. Because what God has instilled in us through Jesus Christ is not an arrogance, but a humility. That we live under a peace. We live in a world that we often don't understand. We live in a world filled with people that we barely know or recognize. But in spite of that, we are all loved. We are all in this together. And we share the story person by person. And as we share those little micro stories, those micro stories of peace and love, it, is, it expands and expands and expands to the macro story of God's love and peace for the world, for the universe, and for you. Amen.